All right. You only haul with the short power snap. And then you give the line back as the line unrolls behind you. And you give it back slowly. You don't shove it back up. You go with the speed of the unrolling line. And then you're going to come forward with both hands. And again, loading move gets everything moving when you're in line with your target. Now you're going to haul down to your left hip. Uh, as your right hand goes, your right thumb goes to the target. That was Joan Wolf breaking down the double haul. Wait, 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 wait. Joan Wolf, episode 100. Wait a minute, let me pinch myself. Ah, yes, yes, it is real. Welcome to episode 100 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In celebration of the 100th episode of the podcast, I can do nothing bigger than bring out one of the biggest names in fly fishing and a person who means so much to me and women all over the world who have a connection to fly fishing. 93-year-old Joan Wolf has been around uh, for most of that time, having started fly casting competitions and winning her first at 12 years old. Joan and I talk about her life in fly fishing, how her connection with Lee Wolf came to be, and how they created the yarn rod, one of my favorite um, training uh, rods. We talk about the power snap, when to start the double haul, and the outdoor magazine that she never quite put together. Um, but uh, but is very proud to see what women are doing, including the Dunn Magazine. You've got to hang, uh, hang out on this one till the end when Joan shares her best relationship advice and how it relates to fly fishing. She blew me away with this, uh, <laughs> with this one, so you got to check it out. Uh, one, one note before we get started, I have um, only 10 slots available for the uh, fantasy-hosted fly fishing trip. Uh, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash destination to check out more and get your name in the hat there. And I hope to see you soon. So, without further ado, here is Joan Wolf. How's it going, Joan? Hi. I'm glad that we are having a nice sunny weather in order to be outdoors, but the rivers are low and getting a little bit warm. Oh, nice. So, so the is the um, so is this a good time to to be fishing out there? We're kind of in almost to August. Is that uh, you're out in the East Coast, right? I'm in, in about a hundred miles northwest of New York City. Oh, wow. So at this time of year, we carry a thermometer, and when we get in the river, we check that temperature. And if it's sixty-nine or seventy, we don't fish. No kidding. So, so pretty it, much yeah. the fishing. Are you starting fishing early in the morning and then taking a break and then fishing in the evening? Exactly. Yeah, yep. that, that's it. Okay. Well, we're going to jump into, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about some of your home waters and things like that. I, I wanted to, you know, before we get into, you, you are known as the first lady of fly fishing, which is, you know, pretty amazing. And you're probably one of the biggest names in the world, you know, when you think of fly fishing. So I'm going to get into all the history there. But um, before we do, can you just tell me how you first uh, got into fly fishing? Well, uh, my father was in the Patterson Casting Club, Patterson, New Jersey, and they met at a pond near our house. And when my brothers were eight and ten years old, dad took them to the casting club and left me out, even though I was older, because I was a girl and women didn't fish or get into casting, it seemed. And so one day I asked my mom if I could use my father's fly rod to try fly casting because I loved what it looked like. So she gave me permission. I took the rod down to the pond and I hadn't put the rod together right and the tip came off and slid down the line and went into the pond, <laughs> which was six or eight feet deep. So yeah. home I went. I was 10 years old. And our next door neighbor got home from work before my dad did. And mother called on him to help because <laughs> she was going to be in trouble too. Uh, and he got got the tip of the rod out with a rake, and so I was saved. <laughs> but instead of my dad being unhappy, he then invited me to go on Sunday morning with my two brothers to the casting club, and that was the beginning. Oh wow! And yeah, 
And so I won something. I won the New Jersey State Junior Championship or something like that in 1939. I still have that little trophy. And I was launched on casting. I just loved it. And uh, even though as a fisherman, I I was ignorant. I would, had no predatory instincts. I would look at the river and think how beautiful the patterns were on top. I had you know, not no thoughts about where would a fish be to get food. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as I learned to cast, I just covered all of the water and eventually learned how to read water through through that process. Wow. That's and and then, you know, from there. So I guess you you know back to 1939, winning the uh, the state champion or whatever that was, and then you can kind of go back to, up to 1951, where I think the distance uh, champion, uh, you took the award. I think there from a full it was male and female competition, right? Can you tell me a little bit about how you be you came to become a distance champion? All right, let me go back to, I, I so I I, I won. Eastern titles and so on. And um, I went to my first national in 1943 in Chicago. And I went to national every year after that for a long time until 1960, basically. Um, and so I, I was in accuracy and there were no events for distance for women because you had to have five people in order to have an event. And women were not casting distance. Right. But I had a mentor whose name was William Taylor, and he was in the casting club, and he gave me my style of casting, not by explanation, but by saying, do it like this, <laughs> which is the way. And until I wrote my book on the mechanics, everyone taught that way, and no one pulled it apart. But anyway, his name was William Taylor. He made um, He cast distance, and so I could drive... He didn't have a car. I would drive into the casting uh, area to practice in the summertime, and I just he he would cast like 150 feet, and I would pull the line back in and lay it out on the platform for him. I was his gilly, (laughs) and I just got so I wanted to do it, and so I tried, and but the rod was too heavy for me to lift the line out of the water. So he ended up making a rod that was lighter, and the line was lighter, so I could still compete. And so I went to my first distance casting uh, event in 1947, and I cast 127 feet, actually. So I was launched. And and I think, you know, my my casting... I was a dancing teacher. I started dancing when I was 10, when I started casting, and at 12 I started teaching, one step at a time. (laughs) (laughs) And, and so, uh, by, so then after I got out of high school, I did not go to college because my family was saving their money for my brothers to go. So I went to secretarial school (laughs) and got a job as a secretary. So, but I was all, my life was all about casting and dancing. Mm-hmm. And when I'd been in high school and then my guidance counselor said, what are you going to be? I don't know. What do you like to do? Cast and dance. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's, how, that's how I ended up. And at that time, women were secretaries or teachers or nurses. Right. And so I ended up going to secretarial school. Okay. And it's done me a lot of good. <laughs> Yeah. So where were we? Oh, where, where well, we? that's good. No, I mean, I've so many things come up as you talk there. I, I, you know, the dancing and casting, and obviously it was a different time when, you know, it wasn't as easy to just to do whatever you want to do. And um, I, I guess a big question I have is, you know, when did you know, you know, fly, you were all in on fly fishing and that was going to be an, a lifelong thing for you? It sounds like pretty early you knew that. Is that is that true? No, I, well, I didn't know that I... I, in the dancing school, we were very successful. I was making like $150 a week in 1952, which was fantastic mm-hmm. because I, so I did, but I wanted to be in the fishing world. And I had w- awakened one morning and thought, if I don't get out of this dancing school, I'll still be here when <laughs> I'm 75, you know, which is ancient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I ended up leaving it. And taking, I even took a job for twenty-seven dollars a week in a local department store for six weeks, and 
uh, that's you know as opposed to my 150 in the right. dancing school. And I was kept trying to talk to the women who were who were selling blouses to leave and do something else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's good. And so anyway, um, <laughs> so I all I could do in the in the uh, outdoor world, you had to be a, a man really and, yeah. and sell tackle. Oh right. And so so all I could do was to give demonstrations and sportsman shows. And that's what I did. And um, I did, I went to a lot of different places, all the way out to British Columbia and so forth. Got paid four hundred dollars for ten day shows, wow. <laughs> paying my own expenses. Yeah. yeah, there was no money, no money. Yeah, yeah. But in nineteen fifty four, I was in a sports show in St. Louis, and the MC was a, had been a silent movie star named Monty Blue. And when I got there, he said, I want to talk to you about your costume. I had been wearing short shorts, uh, rolled down hip boots, and a creel on my shoulder. Oh, yeah. uh, and he said, I'd like you to wear a dress. And I said, what? A dress? You know, and, and he said, no, and I and I will talk while you cast, and you know, I, I will sell the program. So I went out, and I got a, a white and silver cocktail st- strapless dress, high heels, uh, rhinestones in my hair, and that turned out to be a wonderful experience because it, the audience responded to it because they became, you know, fly casting became something nice to look at. Yeah. Uh, the, the unrolling loops and so forth, it's graceful, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so Monty sold the, the, the program very, very well, but I could not go to another town and, and go into their sports show with a different MC. So I had to go back to my shorts and creel and so oh, forth. Okay. But I still have pictures of me in that dress that have gotten attention. That's cool. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll try to, uh, if I, if there's a link out there online, I'll try to put a link to it. I know another picture that gets a lot of uh, press is, is I think you, I think it was at one of the casting um, uh, tournaments. The you national were, tournaments, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what was the one The one where you were, the same thing, you had the, the short shorts, you had the, the tube top on. It's like a famous photo of you yes. making this now can you tell me the story behind that photo and why, why how that became such a big iconic uh photo well i don't really know except that i i, I also i guess i when I, at the end of my casting i had in order in order to be able to cast this heavy tackle i had to use my whole body all right um, you know in terms of, of a woman versus men um and i'll go back to when I made my long cast, how much farther the men cast. But so I used, I knew how to use my body. Never, I've never hurt myself uh, casting for that reason. Huh. Uh, and so I wore, I wore short shorts because I didn't look good in long shorts. <laughs> and I wore a strapless top because I wanted a smooth uh, sunburn. <laughs> nice. Suntan. Yeah. It was strictly, you know, female sure. thinking. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so 1960 is when that okay. photo was taken. That, that was the last, the last year that I competed in tournaments. Okay. I wanted to go fishing. I didn't want to spend my time practicing casting anymore. I was, again, I was out of the dancing school trying to make a living in that outdoor world. And so uh, I stopped competing in 1960. Gotcha. So what was I going to what was I going to go back to? Well, I, you know, I, I was just thinking I'm kind of thinking about something too. You got me thinking that you know we're up to 1960 with that photo, and then you kind of you're finishing the nationals, and you know it's interesting because I think a lot of people think of you not only young but you know older people they don't realize that you had this whole life of fly fishing or fly casting before you met Lee Wolf. Now, is that That's um, right. is that correct? And can you tell Wait, me? Let me but yeah. I'm, Right. I want to go back to, all right, so you're at 1960. Yeah. 1951 was when I won the Fisherman's Distance event against all-male competition. That's right. And the reason I could win it was because it was a nine-weight outfit, oh. and I could do that. And so uh, <clears throat> I, I beat my boy, then boyfriend by one-third of a foot average <laughs> to get that title. All right, and they changed the event the next year. They went to weighted lines, oh. and this, because otherwise we were using floating lines, and so that I think was a reaction to my winning it. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then <clears throat> in 1960, my last year of competition, 
in a registered tournament in New Jersey, I cast 161 feet in the in the men's distance event because there were no women. And the man who won that event cast 20 feet farther. Hmm. So that's that's the, you know, I once read an article in Newsweek when they were taking women into the armed services that women have roughly 55% of the strength of men pound for pound. Right. So that's, you know, so that's where I was. I could never beat all of the men, but I could beat the ones who weren't really good casters, <laughs> you know, yeah. for distance. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Now, 1960. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so, so 19, well, I'm not sure where Lee came in there, but maybe you could talk about how, um, you know, how you can. He's not to there him. yet. Okay. He's not there okay. yet. When did that, when did that, do you make, take us from 1960 up until, yep. yeah, you met Lee. Right. All right. Um, in 1958, I had made a connection with the Garcia Corporation, and Garcia was the company that brought spinning, the Mitchell spinning reel, into the tackle world, which they actually they did earlier. But but uh, I would meet them at sportsman shows and so forth, and so I entered into a contract with them in 1958. I'm sorry, yeah, 1958, mm-hmm. right? And so I traveled the country uh, for them, mostly in the east and in the south. And in 1960, I moved to Miami, and I also at this time was married and had two kids. Uh, so I was only doing a third of my year for Garcia, mm-hmm. but that I ended up being paid to go into a tournament, for instance, down mm-hmm. in the Keys, and I got introduced to saltwater fishing then, and I I just I started thinking of changing my life, so all I did was fish and hunt. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you can't do that without money, so right. I, I never got to do it. And I thought, how long would it take me to get tired of that? And I thought, well, you know, maybe 15 years, something like that. But I've never had the 15 years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, so I've, I've just gone on in with the fishing. And so in 1966, I got a phone call from my boss at Garcia. And he said, how would you like to go giant bluefin tuna fishing in Newfoundland with Lee Wolf? And I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> Giant booth and tuna fishing. I get seasick. <laughs> Newfoundland, foggy place. Yeah. Lee Wolf's kind of a hermit. I mean, I'd met Lee once or twice uh, yeah. in New York before that, but never spent any time with him. Uh, and so I hear my saying, self saying, sure, sure, when? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it seems he was doing a film for, Lee was doing a film for the American Sportsman series, which was very big in those days, mm-hmm. every Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And he always tried to, teach something. And so he wanted to have a woman in this film who had never fished before and have her catch a giant bluefin five times her own weight. And so American Sportsman had chosen Kay Starr, who was a singer. And one of her favorite songs was Wheel of Fortune. She had a little bit of a rock voice, but she was famous. And so before the program could be filmed, she became ill and dropped out. And so uh, American Sportsman called Garcia, and, and there were two women working at the time, another one with me, without me. Uh, and so uh, my boss called me, and that's the rest of the story. And so I went to Newfoundland with Lee Wolf, and, and we were in Conception Bay in Newfoundland. The sun shone every day. There were giant bluefin tuna, like five and 600 pounds, wow. playing in the sun. It was completely different from what I expected, and I caught a 572-pound fish and fell in love with Lee Wolf huh. and changed my life. No kidding. And so we ended up being married in 1967, mm-hmm. and we had 23 years of a wonderful relationship and traveled everywhere fishing wow. and writing. And he, he got me. He got me to write and started me writing. And he was making films at the time, and uh, you know he he was an exceptional. He was he and Zane Gray were the outdoorsmen of the twentieth oh, yeah. century. That's right, yeah, Zane Gray. Yeah, and, yeah. and I rem- yeah, doing things no one had done before. Yes. 
and I, I was watching actually online. There was, I don't know if you remember this movie, but I, it was kind of a short movie, but it was called uh, Autumn Silver. It was in 1986. That's my, it, I, that was me. Yeah. 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 That was, that was you and, and Lee and you, I think you were up in fishing for Atlantic salmon, right? Yes. Yeah. That was Lee's passion. That was, he thought it was the most magnificent fish. And uh, so we, we, Atlantic salmon became my favorite Northern fish and tarpon became my favorite Southern fish. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should say freshwater and saltwater. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, so so yeah, that kind of takes us, you know, uh, all the way around to Lee. I mean, I you know, we won't have a lot of time to go deep into everything, you know, your obviously your life, you've right covered, done a lot of things, but with Lee, is there something that sticks out as kind of, you know, something he really taught you, you know, early on or helped you, you know, I mean, I guess the writing if is it, one big thing. Yes, if it weren't for Lee, I wouldn't be here. This was a man who was unusual for his time. And, and and he was always coming up with thinking outside the box. Uh, and so I got to fish in different places, and I learned how to become a better fisherman mm. through uh, learning his techniques, how to play fish so you got them back in the water before they were, uh, you know, dreadfully tired right. and likely to be in trouble. Um, it, it just, it, it would say, like, if you catch three fish on the same fly, change it. In other words, don't be satisfied with the the mundane and keep, you know, always be looking for the challenge of the fishing that you were doing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he was the father of catch and release, having said in 1939, his first book, game fish is too valuable to be caught only once. And the fish you release is the fish may have been a gift from another angler, as this is your gift to another angler. And so that it's, the words are still great, and of course we're in an era now where everybody releases fish for, for yep. obvious reasons. Yeah, um, uh, that's amazing. And, yeah, and uh, then of course the other thing that happened was that we wanted to start a school, and I, having been the dancing teacher, I wanted to teach fly casting, and no one had ever taken it apart or analyzed it to have a set of mechanics. And so when we opened this, we opened the fish, we were living in New Hampshire and we wanted to have a school, but New Hampshire's rivers were a little more acidic than the Beaverkill. And the Beaverkill was a prime place in the east to, to fish for trout. The Delaware system is just fantastic. It's the right place for all the insects that the trout live on. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Lee would ask to give a, a speech on a weekend here for the Federation of Fly Fishers in June of 77. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we, we got here and we had been thinking of starting a school in in the Batten Kill in Vermont. So then we got here and we said, this is the place. (laughs) There were people street in waders and it was, they had, uh, catch and release areas of the beaver kill. And as I said, we said, this is the place. So we went home, put our house on the market, and we moved here in seven, May of 78. And in May of 79, we opened our fishing school. And so Lee was the inspiration, of course, that people came for at the school. And I got into the teaching of casting because it wasn't just watch me do it like this. That puts the onus on the student. And so I needed to pull that casting apart, um, and and I also started writing about it. And writing about a three dimensional sport, you know, putting putting a three dimensional sport in print is very difficult. And so that was became my passion to figure mm-hmm. out what my forearm is doing in my hand and my upper arm, et cetera, et cetera, and which part of the cast. With, you know, did you, did how did you explain each part of the cast? Right. So that's um, that's that's another reason why I'm here because oh. that's that became my passion. That's how I made my own reputation, mm-hmm. uh, with with you know through through writing. But that's I had right. a column in Fly Rod and Reel for 22 years. Wow. Nobody had ever had a casting column before. No kidding. No, they hadn't <laughs> because everybody did general. Nobody did specific oh, right. moves. Or knew they were doing them, but they didn't know they were doing them. Yeah. So that 
my contribution to the sport. So you broke it down. You really took flight. I mean, with your book, The Mechanics, uh, maybe we can get into that a little bit. But also just on... You know, thinking about the casting, I get these questions all the time in our Facebook group. People like, what's your biggest struggle? Obviously, casting is a big struggle for people. Can you break down maybe just uh, briefly on uh, some common things you see with people that have uh, that they struggle with and, and how you cast? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I know that's not easy to do, but maybe just a, a brief uh, summary uh, of right. some, yeah. Uh, you, use, you use all three parts of your arm, which means your hand from the wrist, your forearm from the elbow, and your upper arm from the shoulder. And and most people don't. They just go back and forth from their elbow. Um, It's really back and forth, and, and this is what makes it different from other sports. It's the back and forth motion of the forearm and hand within the up and down motion of the whole arm. All right. And that is what my casting is. And that's what Mr. Taylor taught me way back, but I didn't, didn't have any idea, of, you know, about what those mechanics were then. Huh. So, uh, so it's, as I said, it, it's compound back and forth within the up and down. And you, uh, are getting, the, and the easiest way to picture this is to have line out on the water in front of you. And you start with the rod tip down, you lift the line inch by inch to the leader connection. That's the first move I call a loading move. It starts to bend the rod tip and and the loading action that makes a stroke. So you're lifting to the leader connection just with your whole arm, basically, but leading with your hand up towards your forehead. You start at your waist, and your back cast is going to be waist to forehead is the path, which is a diagonal. Mm -hmm. And you get to the leader connection. Now you only have to, the line has weight. The leader does not. You only have to take the leader out, and you just have to get the fly to leave the water so you have this tiny little pull back up. And I call it a power snap because it's a snap and it's the only time you really need to use power force. There's no force used in the first move. And then you let the line unroll and now to go forward, you pick out a target and your target on the back cast was your forehead. On the forward cast, your target is whatever is in the water where you want the fly to go. And now you start with your hand at your forehead level and your arm is bent roughly 90 degrees. And the whole arm comes down in a static move. You do not go forward. That's what everybody's problem in casting is. They push their hand out as if they were throwing a ball. Right. And you don't. If the rod is your tool. You just bring the whole rod down in a static position. Let's picture it at 90 degrees until your thumb is on the target. And when it's on the target, now you push forward with your thumb and you pull back with your fingers to the target. And then follow through. Hmm. And so again, it, uh, I've written four books, and yeah. my last book has the be- best illustrations okay. of that. It's Perfect. very hard to it's very hard to do illustrations yeah, yeah. of casting. No, you did a good, as you will see with with other people have done. Yes, you did a good job. Oh, uh, I'll put a link to the uh, the in the show notes to that book and in some of your other books. And yeah, I mean, obviously the casting we can't, you know do it all here on audio so i'll make sure people can get in, right. you know connected with that um so what yeah. you know one thing with the casting it's interesting i remember when i was a kid we we had these things that um we helped teach people because i kind of started early around a fly shop as well and, and it was this little rod with a, a piece of yarn on the end and um that happens to be a lee wolf invention there you go so that that is a lee wolf invention can you explain what how the yarn <laughs> rod came to be yes when when Lee and I were married, <clears throat> he said, the golfers can have little soft golf balls and practice indoors. I want people to be able to practice indoors. And so I went out and looked for yarn. He had the top of a fly rod, a three-foot section of, the, of rod. And we, I've got five different types of yarn, and we tried them on it and found the yarn that worked. And it didn't have weight, but it had air resistance, so you could make the loops. And that, you know, that's basically, I didn't say it when I was talking about the mechanics, but what you were doing is creating an open-ended, unrolling loop. Mm-hmm. That's what casting's all about. And at the end of the loop is your fly that's going to go where you want it to go. Yeah. Um, and so, anyway, so Garcia made that little rod with yarn, 
and they gave the name Flyo to it. It's not okay. a great name, but <laughs> we haven't come up with anything better. <laughs> yeah. And we put out a little booklet with it. Oh, cool. And it really, it was. And other people have copied it. Yeah. Um, other other uh, companies have copied it, but that again, that was the Lee Wolf thing yeah. in 1970, That's... 1970 or so, 71 or two. Yeah. It, it's really, and I still have one, and it's really, it's really helpful because yeah, it forces you uh, to see your loop, you know, and the whole cast. Exactly. Yeah, it's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and one foot of yarn is equivalent to about four feet of fly line. Yeah. So you're not going to be casting. That's right. Ten feet of yarn. No. You know, if you cast six feet of yarn, you're in good shape. That's right. Yeah, it's a short. So if yeah. somebody wanted to, I guess those are still out there. I guess they can make one, or uh, I don't know, you know, where they can. They're find hard them. to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Royal Wolf is the place to ask for one. Okay. Uh, they're having some having trouble finding the yarn. That first yarn that we used was just Hallmark packaging yarn. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, over the years, unless you bought 10 million yards of it, they change it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I think, so, so whatever I think it is, I might be wrong, but I believe that, um, uh, echo also has the yarn rod now. So, um, I'll have to, uh, Tim Rage, it's Tim, yeah. it's Tim Ray, Jeff. That's right. But there's, they have always had a heavier, a heavier yarn. The thing about our yarn was that you really weren't going to hurt anything if you hit it when you're indoors. <laughs> gotcha. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Joan, we are, I mean, I, I, we're about a little over 30 minutes. Do you still have a little bit of time to kind of wrap this thing up? Well, yeah, I want, because I want to talk about women. Oh, good. The tackle was heavy. Like the rod that I cast 161 feet with weighed six and three quarter ounces. The average trout rod weighs now three ounces or less oh wow and so it was heavy for women but the worst thing was the size of the rod grip it was meant for men's hands and the diameter and circumference of the rod grip was terrible it still is mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's one of those things that uh, women have to think about. And the last uh, connection I had commercially was with the Winston Rod Company, mm -hmm. and they made a rod with my name on it that had a groove. It was a, a, a narrower uh, circumference and a groove in the handle, so you put your thumb in there, and it makes all the difference in the world. And in our fishing school, we have a session where they try different rods, and, and the, the rods with a smaller grip are the ones that the women love. Okay. So that's still out there. Uh, and then again, uh, when I first started, there were no chest waders that women could wear. They were, those were death traps. <laughs> you had to, you know, the only thing we could do was boys' hip boots. So you never could wade very uh, deeply. Yeah. And so there were all things, you know, that were against women being comfortable. And men didn't want to have, they didn't know how to tie the knots or lead, make leaders. And so men were always being pestered, you know, fix me, you know, whatever. So they didn't like that either. So they weren't very welcoming. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, Robert Redford's film, A River Runs Through It was the final or the major factor in starting to bring women into the sport. Mm -hmm. the, the beautiful scenery, the beautiful mesmerizing yeah. fly line loops and the attractive men I used to have all to myself were now out there for women to see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they responded. We had more women than men in the fishing school for 12 wow. whole years. No kidding. I mean, it, it was dramatic. Wow. Absolutely. So, so Robert Redford deserves the credit for that. Yeah. Now, that was 1980. God, it was, oh, that's uh, right. It was only 1982. Well, 92. I think it might have no, been 92. 92. Yeah, I think it was 92. Yeah. 92. And 12 years would have brought us to 204. 204, right. okay. And so in the, since then, we have pretty much half and half. Sometimes, you know, it's just men used to bring, if they brought women to the fishing school, it was kind of to prove to them that they, when they went off for the weekend, that's what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and so now um, the, the big companies are having women professionals. 
like I was for Winston. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and that I'm not. I'm going to be 93 years old in October. Wow, that's awesome. And it has taken it. No, and I had I had to live this long in order to see women embracing the sport and men welcoming them to it. You're right. You know, it's it's really the. It, it, I'm glad I lived this long to be able to realize that. You know that it has happened finally. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing about women, women are are easier students. They may be worried about what they're doing a little more than men, because men are expected to know how to do everything. So first you have to get rid of what they think they know before you can teach them anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, but women start from zero, you know, and take one step at a time. Yeah. And so uh, that's where we are now. There are, are magazines that are, I think there's actually a magazine that's all about women. There is, yeah. Just, and I had uh, one, I, yeah. yeah. That's what Jen Ripple, uh, Jen Ripple, the Dunn, and I've had her on the, the podcast. She's she's really great. Yeah, right. Yeah. I wanted to start a an outdoor magazine for women back in the 70s, and it just couldn't work at that sure. time. I wanted to, was going to call it Diana, the goddess of hunting, and make it an, an outdoor magazine. Nice. Just all outdoors. But yep. it was not the right time. So, again, you're talking to a woman who's very happy with That's having great. lived this long and in the right time to see it, and, and, you know, to see it happen. And you're a big reason for, you know, obviously it all happening. And, and Orvis has a 50-50 movement where they're trying to, you know, get – more women into it. I mean, they're, yeah, you're, you're totally right. We're in the mix right now of, you know, they have lots of women's waiters and gear and everything. And, and like, yes. it, it, yes. it, it, it's amazing. And for me, it's so amazing because, you know, I have two daughters and they're five, five and seven years old. And, and yeah. I'm just, you know, they're at that point where they're out there trying, I'm trying to get them casting. They, they like being outdoors. And I, I just feel great that, you know, there's people like you that pave the way that they can, you know, experience and, and love fly fishing yeah. if they want to. Yep. Well, we'll start them with a roll cast. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. How do I? So, how do I get them? Yes. Should I get them a, a small <laughs> rod and get the roll cast going? Yeah, well, get them a rod that's maybe eight feet for a five weight. Okay. All right, and then a roll cast because that's a single cast. You just set up, take all the time in the world, and you learn what to do on the forward cast. And as you can see in a book, you know, you start with that that position with your hand by your forehead and your, and your arm bent 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. and then you pull your elbow down and keep, you know, from the shoulder and make a stroke. And they can catch fish if you put them in the right place. Okay. And, or the other thing is if you hook a fish and you hand them the rod and yeah. let them play it. That's right. You know, that's what I did with my older grandson. And, and it was one of those things where he, he could only basically roll cast at that time, uh -huh. and he didn't do well in the river with it. And, and I, so I said, well, let me try. So I put on a Royal Wolf, which is the other thing Lee is famous oh, for. Yeah. That fly catches trout anywhere in the world. So I hooked the trout and let Alex play it. And at the end, we're walking back out. He said, Graham. It's a good thing Grandpa Lee invented the Royal Wolf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the delights of my life but, oh, uh, yeah. to have that said. That's so, so anyway, cool. yeah. the, now there was also, there's a young woman in California named Maxine McCormick. And she has, is a, a star woman caster now. She's 14 years oh, old. Oh, I, I met her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I met her at the, uh, one oh, of the yeah, all right. she, she was in, uh, she was out, it, uh, yeah. She's At age 14, she has equaled my 161-foot cast. Oh, that's cool. No kidding. She, she did it this year in international competition. Wow. So yep. I have been in touch with her, and the New York Times gave her a big story back in September. Oh, that's and great. And that's the first, you know, because, you know, nobody would ever, in the New York Times guide, you'd never see that. And they gave her something a little bit on the front page and then a big picture on the, another inside page. Yeah. So so she is the, the star of the women's world of, of uh, casting right now. It and this is what I love about my the podcast, this show, is that, you know, you, you mentioning her name, it reminds me, I, I have to get her on my show. To, that'd be amazing to have both, the, you know, you for one podcast and then have her to talk about, you know, the other end. She's getting yes, into it. Yes. That'd be great. Now, we don't, you know, we don't know if she's going to stay in this. She's young enough. That's so true. I think she wanted 
you know, she wanted to be a veterinarian or something sure. like that. Yeah. But, you know, but at least her life is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Know, bigger than just just being in a casting club. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I had a couple other, you know, on, on the casting side, you know, the, the double haul. Can you speak to the double haul? Because I think it's not only is just the casting when you learn casting is challenging, but do you have any tips or advice for somebody who wants to try to get a, a longer cast and do the double haul correctly? Yes. Uh, yes. And that is you have to learn those mechanics, a loading move, a power snap, and follow through. Because you only haul, which is pulling opposite, you're, like as you go back, you're pulling the line forward with your left hand. And it's yep. only on the power snap that you pull. You don't pull through the whole stroke. Oh, uh, okay. So a stroke is a loading move, power snap, and follow through, both backward and forward. Right. Now, it's hard. The backward follow-through we call drift, and you're not ready for that until you learn how to stop and make your good loops. Yeah. All right. So you're going to lift the line again to the leader connection, if you picture that. Mm -hmm. All you do is lift with both hands. You're holding the line in your left hand, the rod in your right hand. Mm -hmm. Lift to the leader as you take that leader and fly out, which is just a second long. You haul. Okay. And the haul is as long as the power snap. It's not measured in inches. It's measured in time. Oh, wow. All right. You only haul with the short power snap. And then you give the line back as the line unrolls behind you. Yep. And you give it back slowly. You don't shove it back up. <laughs> you go with the speed of the unrolling line. And then you're going to come forward with both hands and again loading move gets everything moving when you're in line with your target now you're going to haul down to your left hip uh as your right hand goes your right thumb goes to the target okay so that's it so that's when your right hand goes towards the target that's when you haul do your your second haul it yes on the hand action yeah on the right hand you action. have the whole arm action to get your thumb in line with the target Right. And remember I said your back cast stroke is from your waist to your forehead. Your forward cast stroke is from your forehead to the target. If you add drift, that a backward loading move, then your hand is going to be a little higher than your forehead. Okay. And then there's, you know, then there's the whole subject of casting in different planes. You have to be able to cast horizontally, let's say from nine o'clock to three o'clock. You have to be able to cast at all those planes, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, in order to be a good caster. Yep. Okay. And, and basically, yeah, and obviously your books talk about this. And then also the school. That, yeah. Can you can you describe just briefly, if somebody was to go to the school, what they could expect to, to, to get out of yes. the school? Yeah. Yep. We start on Friday night, and we take a short the, the butt of a rod. And we put that in everybody's hands, explain the mechanics with the blackboard, and they have my book as their textbook, mm -hmm. so they can look at the drawings. And so they learn, sitting in a chair, they learn the mechanics of the arm, of, of lifting and snapping and holding, because we don't do drift for right away, and so on. And, then, and so that's at that night. So okay. they're... They're given the the structure of the casting and the terms because it's a language, basically, yeah. that wasn't there before. And then the next morning, we start them reminding them of all that. And we start them with the roll cast. You don't even start with a full fly rod. You just start with the, the handle and, and the butt end. Because it's the arm motions that make casting work, yes. And okay. and put, giving them a whole rod that don't know what they're doing. Gotcha. Uh, you know, to start with, right? Yeah. And so then the second uh, technique is taking line off the water and putting it back down again. And that's where, you know, that's the lifting to the leader, snap it out, and then going forward down. So we call that the basic cast. And then the next technique is, is false casting. And then the next technique is shooting line. In the meantime, we put them uh, into uh, teaching them about fly line design. And so on, and, and another on the second day, we we take them into the river without uh, hooks, 
and talk about wading and about you know casting, reading the water and uh-huh. all that sort of stuff. So, so it's we're a three doing day, this much. It's, it's a weekend, it's a long a, weekend. Right, right. Just Friday night to Sunday night. Okay, perfect. So yeah. So when they and come they out of it, a, yeah, they have a they full. Teach, when they come out of it, they can be independent and and not pester somebody else <laughs> to help them. That's right. Okay, that's what that's basically the goal is so that you can go fishing alone if you have to. That's great. Or want to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that I, I'm definitely not, we're not going to be able to get to, like I mentioned before. But one thing I did, uh, we had a, somebody in the Facebook group noted the, the pocketed fly fishing vest. And w- was it true that you invented the pocketed fly, the first, you know, fly vest with pockets? Lee, or, yeah. Lee did okay. in 1930, 30 okay. or 31. 31. Yeah. No, yeah, he was the dominant fisherman. You know, that's why I said he was like Zane Gray. They, they were doing. He was doing everything, and then he was flying in Newfoundland, That's where right. they had no no aeronautical help. <laughs> you know, he was all alone in his little super cub. Wow! Just a, a J three to start with. He, he took. He learned how to fly in three weeks and went to Newfoundland. He had camps in Newfoundland, huh. fishing camps for Atlantic salmon. Huh. So there's a, you might you might want to take a little look at his history. I know. Wherever you can I know find that. It. And, that's yeah. yeah. It, where would you recommend if I wanted to take a look at his history? Is there anybody out there that Roy really could could talk, or is there a resource where I could you know? Obviously, we, I can't interview him, but um, you know, who would you recommend? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I could I could talk to you about it, but we don't have enough time here. Yeah, but it, it, yeah. I'm afraid I'm probably yeah because a lot of other people are gone. Oh, you know what? You know what I could talk to <laughs> is is the person who I connected with. Um, there's a documentary about your life. The Joan Wolf Pioneer Woman is coming out here. I think by the end of the year, and um, uh, not that soon. Not but that it, soon. We're trying to get Lee's Lee's. A documentary is the one that's closest to being put out. Okay, yeah, yeah, and uh, and the person who is producing that, he is the one that it's helped connect Jeff us. Jeff Hill. Yeah, 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 and he, um, yeah. so he would probably be a good person to talk to if I wanted to really dig into more of uh, Lee's life. I'm sure that would be the best way to go. Well, you might do that unless he's too busy. Work. He's now working on my documentary also. That's right. Well, and, I'll, let, I'll let him get yeah. your stuff done first. <laughs> Well, Jeff, Jeff is the person who did the DVD that I did. Uh, he came to me in about 1997, and I think that's actually when it came out. And we have sold over 50,000 copies of that wow. DVD. No kidding. It's called, it's called The Di- Joan Wolf Dynamics of Fly Casting. That is, that is really cool. I'll- yeah, I'll, I'll definitely try to put a link to that as well in the show notes so people can get a hold of that. That'd be good. That'd be a uh, Roy, yeah, royal wolf. Royal wolf. Have that. What do you think, yep. um, you know, before we get out of here, I just had a couple of uh, kind of big questions for you. One, you know, out of everything you've done, obviously you've had an impact uh, on fly fishing and everything. Is there anything that you're most proud of when you think about fly fishing? Uh, it's got to be the casting mechanics. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's the taking taking casting apart. Yeah, yeah, and it, and and we still we opened the fishing school in 1979, and we hit our 40th anniversary this year. And when I turned 80, I turned the school over to my son Doug. But the school is on my property. Oh, okay, and so so I'm part of the school. I'm not doing the lectures. I have a wonderful. I had instructor named Sheila <laughs> Sheila Hassan, uh-huh. who is an actually a nurse in the, in the Boston area, and she's been the head instructor since uh, '06, I think. Okay. Yeah, yep. And so um, she does the lectures, and she's doing my words. So it, I'm still there through her. That's right. And. And then I help when she sends people out to practice what she has introduced. Then I go and teach one-on-one Gotcha. with the other instructors. And we have very good instructors we've had for a long time. Uh, we do one instructor for every four people. Mm-hmm. Okay, wow. Okay, that's, yeah, that's pretty good, pretty good ratio. And, yeah. um, be, and, and the last thing I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, again, this is kind of on the same lines, but is there anything, you know, is that kind of what you'd like to re- be remembered for as well as if you had to pick one thing? Is it that, 
you know, is it that school? Is it the casting? Is there any? Is it your your books? Anything else that sticks out? It, yeah. It, it, well, it's those things basically. Yeah. It it's the life I've had in the fly fishing world. Yeah. Um, and which you you know we've basically covered. <laughs> uh, yeah. Have we missed it? That's the thing. Joe. Before I let you go, have we <laughs> have we missed anything? I know we we've kind of touched on a little bit of everything. Is there anything I'm missing before I let you go? I'm only going to remember it after that's right. hang up. <laughs> that's right. Well, well, here's what I'll do. I'll, uh, if you remember it, uh, you know, when I get this out, you can let me know and I can add it into the show notes, anything that we missed. But I think, you know, bottom line is I just wanted to get you on to, to really just, you know, have a conversation like we did. And this has been amazing. And, and to thank you, like, like I said, to thank you because... You know, I think um, you're going to impact a lot of people for many, many years to come. And uh, and I appreciate that because when I'm gone, my girls are going to hopefully be fly fishing as well and enjoying nature. And, and I, they can maybe look back at this podcast and listen to your voice and listen to yeah. us have this <laughs> chat. So I'm excited well, for I that. Well, I think that new, new generations go on. They're going to forget me pretty fast. But one other thing about fly fishing is that if you can fly fish with someone comfortably, you could live with them. Oh, there you go. So there's a word of advice for uh, for relationships as well. So you and Lee got yes. along pretty well yes. on, on the water. <clears throat> exactly. Okay. So it, it brings out it brings out your true character. There you go. So if you're struggling in a relationship, the best thing to do is to get that other person on the water and go fly fishing. Yep. All right. I think <laughs> and, you just changed. And find out the truth. <laughs> you just you just blew my mind, Joan. I, I love it. You you definitely uh, this is the perfect ending for the show. And uh, okay. yeah, I'll let you get going. So um, yeah, the the movies. I'll put all those links in the show notes. So this this podcast is going to be out for a number of years. So want, I'll have links so everybody can connect with your documentary and, and Lee's and and I'll put links and like I said, everything and have people connect with you. But. Um, but yeah, until we connect again, I just, uh, Joan, want to thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time here. We got almost an hour in, so I know we went over what we were talking about. But I, you know, I think you're, you're obviously, you've had a big impact on my life. I remember from my being a five-year-old kid myself, I remember, you know, you impacting me way back then. So um, yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on and spending the time and, and look forward to keeping in touch with the documentary and everything else. Okay. Thank you. I've, right. enjoy, I've enjoyed my time with Great. you. Great. Thanks, Joan. See ya. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Joan. That's J-O-A-N. Thank you for your support. Uh, in the last 100 episodes, this has been, uh, and actually we're a little bit above 100 because we had some bonus episodes in there. So my guess is I think we might be at like 105. Um, I couldn't put this all together without you. Uh, I've talked to so many of you out there and seen emails come in and support for the show. So, um, you know, all I can say is thank you. And the next 100 are going to be even better because historically I've been kind of a slow starter. So I'm feeling good about this. Uh, just one more shout out to the hosted trip, which uh, is coming up next year. I have ten spots to to fill here, so um, we've got some some big stuff planned. So send me an email or uh, go to wetflyswing.com slash destination to um, get some more info on it. And uh, that's what we got. I'm really happy that uh, I was able to chat with Joan. I think it's uh, I think this episode is probably going to go down as one of my favorites. So hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you maybe uh, on the river sometime or uh, talk to you online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.